Hello, I'm Stephen Bias, Music Director of the Arkansas Philharmonic Orchestra, and we welcome you to this virtual performance of Rafe Von Williams' beautiful The Lark Ascending. I'm joined today by our violin soloist, the APO Concertmaster, Eugene Kong, our choreographer, David Justin, and our principal dancer, Carmen Felder. And we'll speak to everyone in turn and, and discover something about this beautiful and wonderful piece. I've been asked many times, how was it that we brought the Vaughn Williams to our season and our programming? I've always wanted to perform the reduced version of the Lark Ascending. It's a beautiful orchestration in its full version, but there's something about the reduction that makes it so intimate and beautiful. And I've always thought that pairing it with Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring in the original orchestration would be a delightful pairing on the concert. They're both beautiful, sublimely beautiful pieces. And in fact, that's what we labeled our program was sublime masterpieces. And indeed, both of the pieces are sublime. But there's something about the Lark Ascending that lends itself to the suggestion of choreographic movements throughout the work. It, of course, has a beautiful violin solo and this economical but, but perfect accompaniment and orchestration in the orchestra. But in the episodes that are displayed throughout the work, there are suggestions of certain choreographic movements or evocative of, of episodes in the story. The piece is based on a poem and it describes both the call of a lark, but also the lark taking flight. Musically speaking, the lark is represented by the solo violin. And Vaughn Williams does a spectacular job of capturing this call of the lark after a very gentle introduction with the orchestra, then the solo violin. And there are alternating episodes like this throughout the work of major sections and the episodes of the orchestra, solo violin, and then the combination of the two. My very first step in consideration of programming a work like this was making sure we had a stellar soloist to be able to perform it. Our APO concert masters, world-class soloist, has performed all over the planet and uh, we're just so fortunate to have her skills. I spoke to Urgene and asked if she would be interested in the piece and she was enormously enthusiastic about it. Urgene, uh, have you played or had you played this piece before our performances with the Arkansas Philharmonic and what were your thoughts and history uh, about performing this piece with the APO and performing it before? Um, this was my first time performing it with um, dance. So I was very, very excited about that. Um, I really resonated with what you said before about uh, motion and the physicality of music and of course the sound of music and to me this was the ultimate marriage um, so I was extremely excited about it I had only previously performed it in its orchestra and solo violin version um, I think that most people think of the violin as this extremely virtuosic instrument which it is but I think that sometimes the more lyrical singing aspects of violin playing sometimes get neglected mm -hmm. or sometimes get undermined as um, not being as difficult. And so it was a real challenge and a joy to, to take on this project. Um, it was definitely familiar, but also new at the same time. And if I could follow up on that, Urgene, uh, thinking about this musically, I, I believe you're spot on with your description about the lyrical qualities of the violin. Uh, did you have any thoughts? Uh, any reservations, any excitement about pairing the music and a solo performance with the orchestra and a ballet company? Yes, I think uh, because I had not had much experience pairing music with live dance, my first question was if there would be any physical limitations, for example, if um, a, a dancer were to take a step forward or, or um, a leg up, for example, would that inhibit my ability as an instrumentalist to, to go beyond what would make sense physically? That was something that I just had no experience um, and had open questions about. This piece, of course, 
is challenging because it needs to give a sense of timelessness and somehow being beyond time. But of course, this music is written in a strict meter. So I think always finding the balance between what kinds of time we can take and what kinds of time we shouldn't take and where the artistic beauty is uh, between all of that freedom and sort of limit, uh, preferred limitations, I think was, uh, again, something that I was super excited to take on. That's a wonderful consideration and one that to many of our patrons would possibly not be aware of the considerations of such things, a physical movement uh, combined with musical and abstract movements indeed. Well, thank you, Eugene. That was, that was delightful. David Justin, as our choreographer, I'm curious if you had performed this work before or perhaps you'd share with us the thoughts you had uh, in considering this in creating choreography to go with this work. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. And, and thank you for the, the invitation to collaborate uh, with the APO. Um, just off the bat, that's a, that's a gift for dancers that uh, um, we um, value, cherish, and, and um, take to heart. So, so thank you for that. Yes, um, you know, I had um, sketched uh, um, this choreography um, back in 2000. Uh, when I was living in England. Um, it was actually one of the first pieces that I had done after uh, a real life-changing experience. And um, spending time in the studio um, with, uh, with uh, a soloist, with, with one dancer, um, trying to uh, create uh, the balance between um, uh, the time and the timelessness that Eugene was talking about. It's something that we really, we really uh, um, took special care to pay attention to. Uh, you know, for me, there, um, there is a narrative inside the music um, that goes a bit beyond simply the, the, the um, oral uh, symbolism of, of the call and the flight. Um, I hear, I hear the, I hear the lark, but I also about, um, uh, halfway through or so, um, I hear a change and a groundedness that um, that that really um, has this folk feel. Dun, da, 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 dum, bum, bum. And it really changes for me at that moment. And that began to develop a narrative about um, the lark being a herald for um, a, a personal self-discovery. Something that um, something that uh, a young person, a, a child, um, possibly discovering their own power, their own voice, as it were. And so, choreographically, the first part is a, a representation of the lark. The second part is begins as a rep representation of uh, something uh, more a human, a, a person. And then in the last part, the, the lark comes to the human and tells them of their power and they grow in that sense. So uh, it, it was really fun to um, kind of build those narratives together musically. And then, you know, some of the other considerations, we did this work in soft shoes. And that you, you wouldn't think that that would be an important consideration, but when you're thinking about the live music, and dancers, bless our hearts, we're noisy. <laughs> we're breathing heavy. Our shoes, if we're wearing point shoes, they, they, they're suddenly a percussion instrument <laughs> that adds to, it can add to the uh, ambiance or take away from it, as it were. So um, we, uh, we perform this work in soft shoes to try to, to, try to um, maintain or sustain the delicate nature of, of the music. Yeah. That's fascinating to think about the musical considerations which would involve the physicality of the dancers, but also the choreographic concerns about such things as percussive sounds of toes or feet striking the floor and movements. That's fascinating. And again, something that uh, is a world that we share with our audience 
to consider as they watch these productions and performances to know that there's a lot that goes on beyond just the first or second level of experiencing a performance. That's right. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Carmen Felder, our principal dancer. Uh, Hello. This piece is so beautiful, and you, I, I, I'm foreshadowing what our viewers are about to see. It was just, well, as I described the music, as sublime beauties and sublime masterpieces. Your performance was sublime. Uh, could you give us your impressions of both the piece and also the choreographer, the choreography from David, and how that came to life in a very short amount of time? Of rehearsing with the dancers and then with the orchestra so for me um we like we went into the studio i'd never heard this piece of music before and um a lot of times like i listen to a lot of different musics um but a lot of times it's like okay we're dancing to this like last year it was we're dancing to beethoven's ninth and north okay yeah i know that one and so this was like oh it's something new i haven't heard it and we listened to it and i was like that's just really beautiful and i love strings so like I love I love the the way they speak because there is this resonance of when you're dancing that you don't let anything completely stop. So it's kind of like this nice little melding of them together. And I remember the process of our rehearsals, we were all learning little bits and pieces of the ballet in random order a little bit. And it was like, OK, we're doing this. We're like, kind of dancing different parts some days. And I remember David came up to me one day and he was like, I think I want you to do the center part. And I was like, okay. Because at that point I was like, I don't remember all the things that were in that center part because I had to leave rehearsal early. So I was a little panicked, um, but we made it through that part. And then I just remember when we were specifically working on the second section of the music with the being grounded and it was, the day I just was like, I feel like dancing just a hundred percent. And David was like, let's do this. And here's kind of what I'm thinking. And he told us like, we're in like a, we're people now we're seeing this world that we are in. And I like to be outside. I like hiking. And, you know, there's like a moment and a feeling of being in the woods and having the sun just kind of dapple through the trees and like, there's this stillness and you look around and like the birds are chirping and it's like, wow. I can't believe I made my, like, I made it here and I'm like experiencing this. And so I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm like really feeling something today. And I kind of took myself there and I didn't really see other people in the room. It was like, my job right now is just to take myself out of the studio, out of the space and be somewhere different. And it, I, I guess it worked <laughs> um, because that's kind of, I, what I did is every time I would hear the music, it was just like, where can I, where can I go on an adventure? Where can I venture with this, my lark friend? It was kind of like, there was a little bird on my shoulder taking me different places. And I really enjoyed that part. And I yeah. love dancing to live music. That's like, I like the spontaneous, but knowing that like, these are the notes, this is what's supposed to happen, but anything could happen. So that's also super exciting to, 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 to have the live music, but also to see you guys. Because a lot of times the orchestra is in the pit and you can only see the top of people's heads or like the top of a baton going. <laughs> um, but to like actually be able to have moments where I could turn around and see what's happening behind me, like it was amazing. That's, that is a really wonderful point, Carmen, that um, for our viewers, the, the spontaneity and the connectivity and the responsiveness of being able to be with dancers and musicians essentially together on the same level was something wonderful. I loved being able to be responsive to perhaps something that the dancers needed, perhaps a little more time here, a second more, or perhaps the tempo needs to go a little faster. I'm curious, and I'll pose this question to all three of you, we go into these projects preparing our element of the production, but of course, always, if we are responsive and reflective of our circumstance and atmosphere, we change and adjust so that we are genuine collaborators. I'm wondering what may have changed in a small or a large way 
from your expectations before being together and then getting together and, and rehearsing and performing. What changed for you, or if there were any changes? Or Jean, would, any thoughts? I think for me, uh, at the risk of feeling like I'm maybe saying the same thing, I, I think that uh, the abstractness of music is a world that I'm so accustomed to. So even when so much of music's history is associated with dance, when I'm just practicing in my practice room or even just playing pure instrumental right. music, I have to almost intentionally think of connecting it to physicality. Even, even as I'm doing this, just the idea of um, a natural law that makes sense to the body. And I think having Carmen also say at one point, we exchanged a few words during the rehearsal where Carmen said, I, I watch your bow arm. And I remember feeling so uh, surprised because I think without even knowing it, um, I was thinking of myself almost as an accompanist to Carmen. Oh. And so I was trying to follow Carmen. And of course, I was also trying to follow you, Stephen. And I was also trying. And so it was almost in that moment, Carmen, that you empowered me to recognize that I, too, as a soloist for embodying the lark, had some kind of agency. But it was informed also by your choreography, David. So I think for me, it was an, a really significant moment of musical and artistic collaboration. A real, a real dance uh, between performers. <laughs> I think yes. Carmen, yeah. Carmen, any thoughts to uh, share about those comments and and any of your own? Yes, to, to piggyback, like because I remember I went to um, the the orchestra's playthrough, so I was like, I'm going to listen to it because as a dancer, when we're listening to a recording, we get very used to the same. Like I knew in the studio, I could count one two, three, four, and then I would go. And like, it was always like that, never different because it's a recording. Um, but being able to listen, it was like little things like there's a different breath right there, or there's an extension of this, this arm movement. And I was like, oh, oh, I can play around with that a little bit more because there's a little more malleability with it not being a recording and it being an actual person like Air Jane playing. And I was like, I, and I, for me, I wanted my arm to match her arm. I was like, that is the beauty of being able to see not only the two of us, and especially if we're like juxtaposed on each other, like, yeah, I want to match that because that's what we do as dancers. And also it's just, it's, it adds a, an element of extra, extra fun. Um, when you're used to a certain tempo and maybe it's played a little quicker and you're like, that suits me quite nicely. I wanted that to go a little faster. Or it's like, yeah, I do kind of need that a little bit slower because this movement looks a lot nicer if we can take that little draw out. And, and David, I, I will uh, share with our viewers that you were in a constant state of evaluation and assessment and determining things about tempo and movement and perhaps arm movements or leg movements would be a little higher or lower and also actually tweaking the choreography and making small changes. I'm, I'm very curious to know from before we started our rehearsals and performances, what changed as we progressed through that uh, process? Um, well, you know, I think Carmen hit on something that, that is r really um, fundamental uh, and uh, important and even even profound to a sense you know um, composers and choreographers uh, it, it's our job to create a framework for another artistic voice to transcend what's on the page and it requires um, that other artist to um, be alive and present in a way that you can't be when you're doing something by rote which is what happens when you work with recording, Carmen. And we end up in we end up in a in a place of rote. But suddenly, when you are when you become alive to the moment, and you are truly collaborating energetically with another artist, that is the transcendence of making art together. And I think that's a that's a really profound and critical um, uh, thing to what this means to be in the performing arts together. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of, you know, what changed and, and what evolved, I mean, it, I, I appreciate you recognizing that I, um, 
<laughs> that I that I and I was constantly trying to pay attention to so many things, but only only to the degree that I could make room for the dancers or or the musicians to really connect with each other and connect to the space. And if you remember, I mean, I guess everybody will see this in a couple of minutes, but um, we also have two or three cameras moving through the space. So, you know, when we worked in the studio, it was, um, it was just uh, the group of dancers and, and myself um, trying to figure out how to craft the space and the time and the shapes. Um, and then <laughs> when we got into uh, the filming, uh, we suddenly added two new people who, um, they have great expertise in their camera work but they don't know the choreography. They're not dancers. They, they bring a whole nother dynamic to um, the process. And so I think part of what you saw was me trying to understand their perspective so that they could bring their artistic voice and their prowess to our process. And I hope that between their work and what Pete has done with the editing, that you see all of those elements come together. Oh, it's so exciting. Uh, to, in your role, David, as director, choreographer, producer, video director, and uh, Carmen, your role as principal dancer and also uh, as secondarily as a string player, a violinist, and urging your role as violin soloist and dancer as well. It was such a wonderful production. Well, from the gorgeous Great Hall at the beautiful Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, it's the Arkansas Philharmonic Orchestra performing Rafe Vaughn Williams' The Lark Ascending with Urging Kong, violin soloist, choreography by David Justin and principal dancer Carmen Felter.
wasn't that just a sublimely beautiful performance? Everything we discussed just before your viewing with the collaborative aspects of the musical, the choreographic, and the flexibility and reflection of one another in rehearsal and performance. What a delight it was for the Arkansas Philharmonic Orchestra to collaborate with the Northwest Arkansas Ballet Theater. And I'd like to ask our soloist, Eugene Kong, our choreographer, David Justin, our principal dancer, Carmen Felder, to share some concluding thoughts before we say goodbye. Eugene. I just wanna thank everybody for watching and continuing to support the arts. And I also wanna thank you, Stephen, Carmen, and David for uh, creating such an emotionally fulfilling experience for me. Just selfishly speaking, I think as an artist, it was important for me during the time of COVID to be reminded of the power of the arts. And I fell in love with Lark Ascending all over again. So thank you so much. Thank you. And David? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, um, all three of you um, brought such uh, um, powerful uh, performances. Um, Stephen, I, I also would just want to take a moment to say thank you and, and congratulations uh, on just a masterful wielding of the baton, a, a very uh, sensitive um, uh, leadership uh, in allowing Urgene and, and Carmen to, to pull out uh, their performances along with the ensembles that were supporting them. Um, so I just, I can't say enough how pleased I am with the process and the product and thank you all very much. I hope everyone enjoys it as much as I did. Thank you. And Carmen. I, to piggyback on everyone, yes, just so much thanks. And I, I hope that for me, I know that whenever I listen to the radio now, Lark seems to follow me around. Um, I hear it more than I've ever heard it before, but it's it it allows me to go on that adventure all over again. And I hope that each and every person who watched got to go on a journey of their own while they listened to this and watched how we make art by working together and how we can create such beautiful things, even in a time that's just very crazy and confusing it. And like, I'll, I'll share one of my favorite parts um, from dancing was when I run forward, I was physically running towards Steven and Ergin and it was like, I was really running to them. I wanted to grab them and hold them and just thank them so much for the gift that they were giving us on stage. For a lot of us, that was the first time to be able to dance with a live orchestra for a while or ever. So that was really exciting. And I hope everyone enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you. I know I did and I was in the thick of it, but yes, indeed. Well, on behalf of the Arkansas Philharmonic Orchestra, the Northwest Arkansas Ballet Theater, Urging Kong, violin soloist, David Justin, choreographer, and Carmen Felder, our principal dancer, we'd like to thank you uh, for supporting us, supporting our wonderful company of dancers and orchestra members, and to the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art for having such great support for people in our region and the arts. Thank you for joining us tonight. Bye-bye. Thank you.